Pterodactyl here, and today we're going to be talking about this. This is called the Kazuma 800 Mammoth. You know, it's a relative of mine, because I'm a pterodactyl. This is a mammoth. This came millions of years later, though. So I got this thing probably about two years ago. Maybe some of y'all seen it in the background of some videos. Well, I've been pulling it in lately and trying to get this thing spruced up and it's pretty cool. You know, it's a Chinese made side by side. And uh, when it was brought here for repair, uh, what it was gonna cost to fix, the customer decided that they didn't wanna spend that kind of money on it. So I ended up buying it from them. And now I'm fixing it. And boy, it needs a lot of work. You know why? Because they left it outside. Remember I always say, don't leave your stuff outside. And y'all say, oh, Terrell, I leave my lawnmower outside all the time. I don't have these problems. Well, leave your lawnmower outside for five years and don't run it. Let me know what kind of problems you have. Because that's what they did with this. We're going to show you some pictures of how it looked before and after. So I did a lot of stuff to this. We've got two videos on this. One of them is a fuel pump hack where I put in that low pressure fuel pump because this one's got the fuel pump that's in the tank. And I seen online where some people were saying, you know, I was trying to find that fuel pump. I can't find that fuel pump. Well, I show you that you just mount one of these external ones. I had to rebuild the carburetor. Uh, I ordered a kit for it, but you can get a complete carburetor for about 150 bucks from VMC. Remember VMC? They sell Chinese parts for a lot of stuff. A lot of these Chinese quads and, and go-karts. And they do have some parts for the side-by-side. -side. Not a lot, but they do have a complete carburetor. But I bought a rebuild kit that had come all the way from India. Because this thing is a three-cylinder, basically it's a three-cylinder Suzuki engine. Even though it says Zhang Man or whatever on there, it's basically a Suzuki car engine that they use over there in Asia. They use this little three-cylinder engine in some cars. So I rebuilt the carburetor, put the fuel pump in, and then we had to do the, the shifting hack. This thing wouldn't shift. And it was right in here, that shaft, where I added a grease fitting underneath. Now, I could have put the grease fitting on top, but water and dirt and stuff, uh, I didn't want it to, to get on there. So that's why I opted to put it in the bottom. So now I can grease this shaft, because that's the problem. Can't get any lubricant to this shaft. And the, over time, water and moisture would get in there, and it was making it so it was unable to shift. I do have the bed, there's the bed over there. I just took it off because I had to put the trans back in and I'm trying to fix anything that was bad. All the brakes were locked up on it because it been sitting outside, I had to fix all that. Uh, I don't know about this battery box, but I don't know if this is a factory. Maybe some of y'all out there have one of these and know. But this is what the battery sat on. And I don't know if this was factory or not. Two pieces of wood. So I made me a template out of some cardboard. And I had some stainless sheet metal. And then I used my brake and made me a battery box. And I've got the belt cover. I put a new belt on it, which you can also get from BMC parts. It's a Napa belt, but I got the good one. There's two different ones. I got the G-Force belt. I opted to buy the, the better, more expensive belt. I had to tidy up all these wires. These wires were horrendous. They were long, and I, I, I don't know if this is how it's supposed to be, but I tidied it up. I think maybe the battery box went here, and the battery dropped in. Again, I don't know. Maybe it was plastic and it broke. Cheap plastic. 
But just about everything works. You know, the horn works. The turn signals work. Um, the gas gauge doesn't work. I think I need a sender, which they got at VMC. I'm going to see about getting it. The temperature gauge didn't work either. And then Elkskins found a wire that was off on the back of the manifold back here. This wire back here. Maybe the cameraman can get it. This little tiny green wire back here was off. This connector is kind of crappy. I'm going to clean up these connections. But this wire was off and now the temperature gauge works. So I'm going to... I'm going to fix that. I had to tighten the, the belt. Remember in the one video, the belt was squealing. I had to tighten the belt. And uh, there was no seat for this side. The seat was missing. And the guy, it, he lost it or something. So I got a bunch of these seat cushions from a guy. There's one here. We use them to kneel on while we're working. So some customer came by, had a bunch of these. So here's a good clean one. So I'm going to put that in here. I'm going to make a seat that's removable. I'm probably going to paint this to spruce it up, probably paint these side panels, make it look a lot better. The drink holders, I don't know what was going on here, but uh, Here's a couple off of some Craftsman mowers. Plus they're bigger, so it can hold a, a koozie, a big koozie. So I'm gonna try to mount these where those went. This light, this light works now. This didn't work. This was added on. You know, and you can take it off and there's Elkskins. Hey, Elkskins! Hey! Alright, get back to work. So this works. Pressure washed and cleaned all this. The center console. Had a, this corner was missing. So I put some fiberglass uh, matting and some fiberglass resin on the inside corner and then I bondoed this with bondo and sanded it fixed that corner and then painted this and then it had some kind of foil tape in here that was all falling off and this is that that foil tape you buy for like doing duct work like heating and air guys use so I just relined it with this and what else Oh, it had a winch. Somebody added a winch to the front. Look at the winch. It's totally ruined. I took the winch off. I'm going to leave it off. If I sell it, whoever buys it, they can put a winch on it. You just go to Harbor Freight and buy one of these. That's red metal now. And then this was the bash plate that went underneath there. And they kind of chopped into it. But I got our our Terrell HB350, that Terrell glue that we sell, like liquid plastic. And I fixed all this, fixed all the cracks. That stuff I used over a tube on this on this thing. These headlights, we're going to show you pictures of them. We're so yellow. I sanded them as best I could. I can't get that yellow out. So I sanded them, buffed them, and then clear coated them with clear coat paint, spray paint. And then there's little strobes in here. Somebody added little strobe lights. So I'm going to hook a separate switch for that. These ears were all broke off. They must have smashed into something with this. So that HP350, look at that. It's strong. These aren't going to break now. 
And then the ones that weren't broke, I just put some HB350 on that anyway and reinforced it. We're going to show you pictures of how they had it. They used some uh, Gorilla Glue or something and they didn't do a very good job. So both of these were busted. Now they're now they're like new again. So I'm going to paint this. Give it a light sanding and I'm going to rattle can this to make it look better. Some of these posts were busted off. So HB350 and the ones that weren't broke, I just layered it up anyway to make them stronger. So here's a little a little trick. So, a couple of these posts were busted off. So, how do you hold the post in place while you're putting this glue on there? Because you got to let this glue dry for like over 24 hours. So, you get some crazy glue or some super glue, and you use the super glue to glue it in place to hold it. And then let the super glue dry, and then it, now it's held in place. Then I come back with the HV350 and layer it up. So the super glue acts as, you know, your finger for holding it. That's what I had to do on these headlight lenses. These, some of these tabs were broke off. So I super glued or crazy glued them back on. And then I was able to go around and layer it up. Like this whole corner was like busted off. And this one, this one was missing altogether. So I took a piece of plumber strap and folded it over and made it like a little clamp over the top of the piece that was left. And then I glued it real good with that HB350. That ain't coming off now. So it's going to look good. You'll see when it's all done. For very little money that I've got invested in this thing. And then... A couple of these, where this goes on, on the back side of here, they got little nuts welded on there. Well, a couple of them nuts busted off. So I'm going to get my nut cert tool. This is a nut cert tool. Comes in all different sizes. I need M5 is the size of those screws that were in there. So I'm going to put a nut cert, two nut certs in there, and then I'll be able to put the screws back in. I went up to our local hardware store, and I bought these metric stainless screws. So they won't rust. Got rid of those, those screws that were in there. So I'll drill them out, and we'll put the nut certs in there, and I'll show you, I'll show me uh, doing that. And then the hinges, these were the hinges for the hood. Plastic and they broke. So I'm gonna use these as a template. I've already marked them out. I'm gonna cut, you okay over there Elskins? Yeah. I'm gonna cut these out, drill the holes, and then I'm gonna get me some steel tubing probably some 3-8 steel tubing and I'll braise a little piece of tubing to one side here and I'll braise a little piece of tubing to that side there and I'm gonna make my own hinges but this time they'll be made out of steel you'll see when I get them done I'll show them to you and this is the bracket for the seat that seat I just showed you I got me a piece of 2 inch wide 3 16 flat stock and I had a piece of round bar stock three or four feet long that's about the diameter and this is where this pin's gonna go in so we're gonna go back over there I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna make that seat from that chair work so here's the passenger seat and it was all busted and again HV350 like liquid plastic because this is plastic and I know why this broke, because this pin, it had a big lip on here, so it would lock in. And then when you go to pull the seat out, it was so hard to pull up, 
that you would break it, and that's probably how they broke this. So that little lip that was on there, I ground that off. And you see it's got a little tab in the back because that's how these seats went on. And then it goes in there. So you just slide that little tab in there and then you push the pin in that hole right here. So what I'm gonna do is take this piece of flat stock because it's two inches wide It'll slide in there, and then I'll just weld this to the bottom, and that'll be my pin. And I'll just drill some holes in here, because this is wood on the bottom. And I'll just screw this to here. I'll paint this, of course, after I weld that pin on there. And then I'll be able to take this seat and just slide it in like that, and lock it in. The only thing, it's going to be orange. Well, who cares? And that's how I'm going to fix that. Just in case you might have one of these and you're like, I wish I had a seat for it. That's a good idea, Terrell. It's a darn good idea. So here's my M5 Nutzer. So what you do is you take a drill gauge and you got to find out what size hole to drill that the nut cert fits in. So in this case, 932. Won't fit in 1764, so 932. And here's my five millimeter M5 die that came with this kit, this nut cert kit that I bought from this company Stark. I got a lot of stuff from them and it's good stuff. Some of y'all may have seen me use this in some of my other videos. I used it on the Palomino. It's good for she um, sheet metal. And I used it on Slippers RJ project that we're working on. So this one comes with 5 16 quarter 20, and 10 24. So for that hardware, and it comes with M5, which we're gonna use, six millimeter and eight millimeter. So, you just unscrew this part off of there, and you pull this little collar down, and unscrew this, and then I'll put this back, and the 5 16 is what I used the last time, and I'll take this, and you screw it in there. And then you just turn it until that this little locking collar thing, they give you a tool, but this slides down. And that's how you get it in and out. And then you put this on, and that kind of keeps it centered. And then we take our nut cert and screw it on the end. Now I'll get that 932 drill bit and drill out them holes and we'll put these nut certs in. Let me put this away before I lose it. So that little fastener, that nut they had welded on the back is gone. It'd be too hard to get back in there and try to weld it, so you're gonna put a nut cert in there. So I drilled it out, 930 seconds, put the nut cert in there, and then you just Squeeze the handles together. Unscrew it. Now you got threads. Now you got threads again. So here, we'll do it again on this side. There's another one missing. Screw that on the end. This one's missing back here. Squeeze the handles together. What it does is it like rivets it in there. No welding. Now I got threads in there. This is a handy dandy tool, let me tell you, especially if you want to 
put some threads and some thin stuff, thin metal. So now I can put this bash plate back under here, which will kind of help protect the radiator somewhat. Too bad this part here they cut out is missing. So I had to take my five millimeter tap and tap out the other holes that didn't have the nut surfs in it because they were kind of rusty and crusty. And whenever you're working with stainless steel hardware or any hardware that's going to be exposed out here to the elements, you should put some kind of never seize on there, anti seize. And we sell this in our online store, this Belco Cincinnati. We got it in the copper and also in the silver. So I put some anti seize on here. Put this last screw in. I guess I could make a new one of these out of maybe some sheet metal. It's only missing this corner. But this was cut out for the winch. It's got the mount for the winch on here. There. Now we got that back in. Now I want to talk a little bit more about some other little upgrades I did because these materials that they use are so bad. Where's my belt cover at? Where's that belt cover? What'd I do with it? Oh, here it is. I got stuff everywhere. The shop is busy. So take a, take a gander at that. That's why you gotta save a lot of this stuff you get. So there's a gasket that went in there, and it was a rubber gasket, and it all fell apart. So I'm like, what can I use? What can I use, Terrell? What can you use? That's me talking to, talking to myself in the third person. Think, Terrell, think. So I saved this stuff. You know, you get this stuff, right? Sometimes when you get packages, this stuff comes, and I saved it. So I took a pair of scissors, and I cut it. I cut three different strips and laid them in there, and then I used some weather stripping adhesive. Super weather strip adhesive. This is yellow, they got it in black. And I just glued that in there. So now I got a nice new spongy gasket. Because that one was all, all fell apart. Look at that, huh? It's just those little things, those little nuances, those little subtleties. So when I go to put this cover back on. And another thing with this hood, let me get this, I can put this on now that I showed you, showed you all it. Now I can actually put it back on. I think I'll go back to the hardware store and get some more of those Phillips uh, stainless screws to hold that cover on. You know what I was thinking about putting in there? Some stainless steel thumb screws. So that way, if I need to take that cover off, I don't need a screwdriver. I can just take them out with thumb screws. That's what I think I'll do. I'll get a couple of thumb screws. So this hood, it looks like it had some weather stripping on here. So it would make a seal between here. And it also looks like it had some down here too. From here to here. There would be some kind of weather stripping. So I did another project years ago. Um, you can look it up in Carol's Toys. I did that John Deere tractor that had the cab on it. And I redid the cab and I had to buy all new weather stripping and stuff for it. So I had some of that weather stripping left, but I didn't have enough. So I went on the inner screen and I bought me some more of this. So I'll be able to take this and stick it on here, like so. because I'm sure the one that was on here probably rotted off. And then that way I'll have a nice, 
a nice seal up in there. Okay. And then I'll be able to do, do the same down here. I'll cut a piece and stick it on here when I get done painting this. And then when I close the hood, it'll be all sealed up. You'll see when I get it all done. And I'll have my cup holders in there. I know you're thinking, I got one of those kazoos. I'm going to find me some junk craftsman lawn tractor. Because that's what these came off of. I went out in the junkyard and robbed these off of some junk lawnmowers we had. All I got to do is make these holes bigger. So that's where I'm at on this Kazuma project. So next we'll be painting this, putting the headlights back in, putting my hinges on. What color are you going to paint it, Terrell? Oh, I'm going to paint it blue. That same blue as the lift because I got a box of, of that blue uh, spray paint from my brother Farrell. He gave me like a case of that stuff. He had it at his shop. He's like, here, you want all this? You can have it. So that's a nice color blue. So I'm just gonna paint it blue. This and this I'll have to mask off. It was some kind of camo, but like my shirt. Which again, you can get this in our online store too. This sounds like an infomercial, don't it? All this never sees and shirts and all kinds of stuff we sell. And like I said, I'll paint this black again in the front with some spray paint. I may even uh, highlight this emblem with some white like I did up here. I did that with Mr. Paint Pen. I just went around and when there was some pest here bothering me, he was talking, so I thought, you know, I'll just go ahead and paint that while he's yammering on and on about nothing. But I drove this thing, it's pretty cool, it runs pretty good. I've seen people uh, that have them, seem to like them. It's not as uh, cheap as some of that stuff is, but. And it's not a John Deere, that's for sure. Oh, it's not a John Deere. I know this side here, this big hole in here, but I'm going to leave that. That's missing. I'm not going to patch that all up. We'll just leave that missing. That's called a whiskey dent. We'll leave that whiskey dent in there. Or in your case, a ham's dent. That's a ham's dent, but I didn't do that because I haven't driven this much. Look, it's got seat belts. It's like a little car. Got the, the, the slow moving triangle in the bed. So I'll be able to drive this thing around. Somebody added these switches here. This one doesn't light up, but there is power to it. This switch, they had power going to this, these wires. That's where that switch goes. There's a wire on each side, and I don't know what they had up, up here. They had some kind of light or something or something up here. It's got a cigarette lighter. When do you see that anymore? Look, there's a cigarette lighter in there. I haven't tried that yet to see if it works. Oh, another thing they had is they had some little, they had some little halogen lights mounted up here, but they didn't work. And that's what this wire went to. I think I'm going to hook this wire to the strobes that are in the headlights that they added. The strobes work. And that's off of that yellow switch. And I think I'm going to get a better flasher because the flash is kind of slow. And look at it, it's all rusty. and You should have seen the wires under here. They had all kinds of wires chopped into and oh yeah uh, musty would like that check this out this this overflow tank or recovery tank for the radiator it's a volkswagen part look it's got the vw emblem on there and the vw part number sean that's a carol fan he stopped by here he's a, a volkswagen uh mechanic 
and he spotted that. He knew right away. He saw that. He goes, that's a Volkswagen recovery tank. Look, it's got the VW emblem. He knew right away. He gave us uh, some stuff. He's a lawn boy guy. He's into lawn boys. And he gave us a lawn boy. I'm not going to tell you what it is and give away the surprise. You'll see this winter. But he gave us a lawn boy. We're going to be doing another lawn boy video. So yeah, this thing's pretty cool. It's going to look good when I get done with it compared to how it looked when it came in. I know the pressure washing that you did, it improved it by 100%. Yeah, I got some pictures to show you. This was all full of acorns in here and pine needles. and I vacuumed everything out, put some uh, soap on here and gave it a good pressure scrubbing. Did you mention about the fuse? Yeah, it had some fuse. This is where the fuses go. This fuse for the ignition was melted. I don't know why. Might have been pretty bad. Might have been getting a bad connection. It wouldn't start one day. I had no spark. This fuse was all melted. So I fixed the connector in there, squeezed it back together, put a new. Put a new fuse in it. Oh yeah, and one other thing. It just goes on and on, Terrell. Here, check this out. Here's, I got my neutral light. See if I can get it to do it. It doesn't always start. See, look at it, see it does that. You can hear it engage in the solenoid. You know what old Terrell's gonna do, don't you? I'm gonna do my solenoid trick. I already got the solenoid mounted. I got a video where we use another solenoid to boost this solenoid. So, you take a solenoid, this acts like a booster now. So here's the power wire that goes to this lug that's coming right from the battery. I'm gonna take that off, I'm gonna take this off. I'm gonna run that cable to here, and I'm gonna run this trigger wire to here. Now this is a three post solenoid. It grounds when you mount it. If you've got a four post solenoid, which would have another post like this down here, you can use one of them. You just gotta run a short wire to ground. But I use the three post ones because this grounds itself. As Soon as I drilled and tapped into here, this is now grounded to the frame. So you take this cable off, you take this wire off, run it to one of these, doesn't matter which one, then you run another cable from the other side of this back to here. Then you're going to take a short piece of wire with an eyelid on it, bolt it to this too, and plug it into that. So what that does is, when you turn the key, it's going to energize this solenoid, which then is going to send power to this, which sends power from here right to that trigger and it acts like a little booster and gives it a boost and then it should start every time so next time we see this i'll have it all wired in we'll go over the wiring again and we'll show you how that works and that should take care of that intermittent that that annoying come on come on this thing runs pretty good once it warms up Kazuma! 800 Mammoth! Like the band Mammoth. Remember them, Mammoth? That was a band too. You like those band references, don't you? Went to the auto parts store and I got a new flasher. Now flashing over there in England, that's got a whole different meaning, right mate? Maybe you guys call this a blinker. So I went and got a new one and I took the mount off the old one and again, with the HV350, I glued it on there. So I took the super glue to hold it in place, and then once the super glue dried, I put the HV350 on it. Now all I gotta do is mount it back where the horn was. But look at how, how it flashes now. Look, nice and fast now. Not like that, that cheap one that was on there. There's the other one over there. See, it flashes. 
So that's a lot better. A couple other things I found out. I need to take the fuel tank out because it's so dirty in there. And then I started messing with the gas gauge. I thought, well, maybe I can fix it, but I think I'm going to have to buy a new one because it was it was ruined. This thing was frozen. And the little bobber on the end, it disintegrated and was laying in the bottom of the tank. So I got a cork from a wine bottle. And it works. But the thing is, this arm doesn't go all the way to the bottom of the tank. So by the time you get gas in there to start filling this thing up, I got about a half a tank of fuel in here and the gauge is only showing about a quarter. So this thing has got to be bent down. But I'm gonna I'm gonna get a hold of VMC parts and see if I can get a new one. But here we're gonna go over to the gauge. Look at the gas gauge. Because I did free it up and get it to work. And there's about a half a tank of gas in there and that's what it's showing. And this temperature gauge I think is bad. Because I started wiggling on these wires and it started working and then I noticed that these were loose. So when I started wiggling on it when the motor was hot, it started to move. And I go, oh, that's good. You can see it's getting some power to it. Watch when I shut it off, the needle will drop down. But I think it's bad. Because as soon as I tighten them up, then it wouldn't work at all. It's only, it's doing the same thing as before. So I'm gonna try to buy a new one. Because I know this is the temperature sending unit back here. I put a new connector on it. So let's see if the cameraman can get down in there. So in case you got one of these, this is for the temperature gauge. And this one above it is for the fan, the electric fan. So you might have one of these and like, I don't know what all this stuff does. What does all this stuff do? And I took this out and tested it and it did test good. And I know the fan's working because it's kicking on and off. Oh, and another thing. See, it just goes on and on and on with this. See, that's why you don't leave stuff outside for five years. It just ruins everything. So I was running it, and I filled up that, that uh, overflow tank on the front for the antifreeze. And I was running it, messing with the gauge, and antifreeze started gripping in this area here. So, I got the pressure scrubber out and I cleaned the engine real good. And this is the water pump right here that goes through this timing belt cover. And antifreeze was dripping from under here. So there's a, probably a weep hole. So the seal on here is probably bad from it sitting for five years. You can still get the water pump. So I'm probably gonna have to change that water pump at some point. But for now, I'm going to clean out this tank and all that. Oh, and another thing. I'm starting to sound like a broken record. And another thing. I got my solenoid hooked up and my seat bracket made. Here's my seat bracket. Uh-oh. Sirens. I hear sirens. I hope they're not coming to get me. Here they come. There they go, the ambulance. There's a nursing home over there. I'll probably be in it soon. My solenoid trick. Here we are, all hooked up. So see what I meant? I took the wire off of here and the trigger wire, and now it's here. So here's the original cable that went to the starter. 
And here's that trigger wire that went to the starter. Then I took another piece of cable and ran it back through to here. You can't see it, but it's going underneath. It's going to the starter, and then I ran this little jumper. So what happens is when I turn the key, it energizes this solenoid, which sends power to here, and now this short wire goes right to that. And now it, it kicks over every time. No more intermittent. No more intermittent. Every time. No more clickety clack. So there's a trick for you. If you got one that's doing that intermittent clickening that we showed you, all you gotta do is get a cheap lawnmower, three post solenoid, and do my hack. Cause that's annoying hitting that key and it's clicking, 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 clicking. Finally it catches. Especially when it gets colder out, then it's even worse. Now let's go inside. I'm working on the nose now. Started sanding and priming, filling in all the little imperfection with that sand and fill primer. So I gotta sand, do a little bit more sanding, and then I'll spray the whole thing with the primer, and then I'll uh, put the top coat on. All rattle can. I bought that Rust Oleum rattle can, sandable primer. Just like the stuff they use in the at the body shop, it's just in a can. And I like this, this thing, you gotta get one of these. This is like having a spray gun. Yeah, sit there with your finger on a spray can. I got this at uh, Maynard's, or you may say Menard's. Waste more money at Menard's. You waste your money, you waste big money when you shop Menard's. Like my Menard song? That's where I got this. I'm sure you can buy it online. You can buy anything online. Now on my cup holders that I got off of Craftsman lawn tractors, a couple of junk ones, I made a template. I stuck this piece of that 30 brick cardstock under the fender of that uh, Craftsman tractor and made me a template. And then I laid it on here. Now the only problem is I centered it over that old hole and when I went to drop this in, it was hitting on this bar. So I had to move it over a little bit. But look at how it fits. Look at it, it hugs that. So I can get some HB350 and glue this, this baby in there and look, it looks like it was made for it. So when I go to do the one on that side, since I already messed this one up, I know that I gotta move it over. So I already marked it and moved it over for this side. And that should fit in there tight. Cause I had these cup holders on a couple of junk mowers out there. So that'll look good, it'll look factory. So when I paint the dash, then I'll glue this in. Now another thing on this, Kazuma. All these panels got nuts behind these screws. So when you go to take these screws out, you gotta reach back there and get them nuts. So again, that nut search tool, I put a bunch of nut search back here. Drilled out the holes and put them six millimeter nut search in there and on the side. So now, when I wanna take one of these panels off, I can just unscrew it. So if you got one of these things, you're like, hey, that's a good idea, Carol. I'm gonna get me one of those nuts or tools. So I'm gonna do that on this panel because there's nuts that are backing these all up. And I'm gonna do it on that side. So whenever I wanna take one of these panels off, I don't have to fumble around with them nuts that are back there. Now I got to thinking about this hole in here and I know what a lot of y'all are, are going to say in the comments. 
you should fix that turtle. I'm sure you could fix that crack. You should fix that crack, turtle. There's a way you could fix that. I'm sure you could fix that. Yeah, 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 I hear you in the comment section. Again, 30 brick cardstock made a template. And I was thinking, what can I use? I need, because this is plastic, basically. This isn't fiberglass. And this isn't that, like, hard plastic like those John Deere hoods are made out of. This is, like, flexible plastic. So this is a battery tray out of a junk lawnmower. And it's about the same thickness as this plastic. So I'm just going to cut me a piece of this out. And then again, that HV350, you got to get some. We sell it in our store. It's like liquid plastic, plastic in a tube. And I'll glue that piece in there. And I could probably take a little bit of that HV350 and fill in the crack on the outside. Because that HV350, it says on there that you can, uh, you can paint over it. So I may be able to use it like Bondo and fill that in where it's not so noticeable, that crack. And then I'll have that fixed. And then you can quit yammering on in the comment section on how I should have fixed that. I'm fixing it now! I got my patch cut out and it fits in there pretty good. It looks good. Then I take some 80 grit sandpaper and I scuff this up real good. Both sides, both pieces, to give it some tooth. So the HB350 will stick to it real good. Then I take a rag and a little bit of carb spray on the rag, and then I wipe it down to get any of the little dust particles off. And then I'll take some duct tape and stick it on the back side here. And that's gonna hold our patch in place for us and then I'll run a good bead of that HB350 over it. That battery box piece of plastic worked out great because it even had a little, a little lip on it, a little ledge that I was able to use just like the other side's got a little ledge on there. So that'll make it strong. So here's the bead that I laid on there, the H3350. Now I'm gonna let this sit overnight. And when I come in tomorrow, I can pull the duct tape off and then I'll fill in the crack on the backside, like Bondo almost. I'll, I'll put some in there and then I'll try to smooth it out. And then uh, I think it says you can even sand it down, if I'm not mistaken. Once I was wrong, but I was mistaken. Well, I got the dash all painted on the Kazuma. Looks pretty good, don't it? That's Ford Blue. Ford Engine Blue. Remember I was telling you my brother Farrell gave me a bunch of cans of spray paint? Well, that's what I use. It's not a pretty perfect job, but you know what? This is a side-by-side. -side. It's gonna be out in the dirt and the weather and out in the woods getting sticks and everything against it, but it looks good. And I got my cup holders installed. They're bigger than the ones that came on there from these out of that Craftsman mower. And I also say, or spray painted them, I almost said sandblasting. Spray painted them, and I got them in there. Now, these, there was rubber in here, and it was all dry rotted and after I got them painting it, you know, it looked, it looked like crap. It looked like doo-doo. So I remember I have this trim, which I take off of old lawnmower seats. Now you gotta remember, I'm repurposing this thing. I'm, I'm trying to do this on the cheap. So I have a bunch of this that we take off of old lawnmower seats. You know what this is, this trim, it goes around those old lawnmower seats. And I already did it right here. I'm gonna add some of this around, around here. I put the seam right here in the middle. And then I put some weather strip adhesive, some black weather strip adhesive to kind of hide that seam. So it doesn't look so bad. 
So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that around here too. Push it on there. And I didn't glue it on there because it fits on there pretty tight. And it molded all around there. So you can do this too if you got one of these. You're like, that's a good idea, Terrell. And then I painted the, the dash here. I took this off. Took it apart. Masked that off with masking tape and I painted that with some satin black. Just, just like I did with the cup holder. Again, doing this all on the cheap. Then I noticed when I was painting it, there's a power port under here. And I'm like, I wonder if that power port works. So I got this flashlight. It's got an LED on here. And I plugged it in to see if it worked. And see it works. It lit up. But I had to wiggle it around because it wasn't making a good connection. Because it was all rusty inside there. Remember this thing was sitting out there for five years. So I don't know if some of y'all seen me do this before. I made my own little flapper. And this is a roll pin. And I took a piece of emery paper. This is like a quarter inch roll pin. Took a piece of emery paper and folded it in half. And slid it in that groove of there. And made like a little flapper. A little flapper sander. And I run that thing up and down inside that. And then sanded it up real good. And then when I shoved this thing in there, now it's working like a dream. Look at that. Before I had to wiggle it to let it get a connection. And now it's working. So there's a little tip, a little tip trick for you. My little flapper. And I never checked to see if the cigarette lighter worked. So you got to turn the power on. But I'm surprised that all the electrical on this thing works. The lights and everything. And I'm like, I never, I never checked to see if that cigarette lighter worked. So you got to plug it in. And then there's a little light here next to the ignition. And so I had to go online to figure out, you know, what is that light? What's that for? They say that's for when the electric fan kicks on to let you know the fan's on, that light will come on. And that little warning sticker on the glove box tells you don't shut it off if that fan is still running. Maybe I have to turn it on all the way. I thought it worked. And then this little spot here is for a switch. Probably for the winch. If you bought the winch for this thing, it came in a kit. There it goes. Boom! Look at that. You light up that big old fat cigar. But this is a little plug for a switch, and I think that was for the winch. When you bought the winch kit, you put the switch in there and you can operate the winch. And you see I painted the glove box door black. And I also painted inside the glove box. Because I had this off. So again, doing this all on the cheap. Just little things. So the temperature gauge, remember temperature gauge wasn't working? Well, you know what I found out? When I unplugged all this to take this off so I could paint it, I noticed that one of the terminals in there, see how little thin them terminals are? This green wire for the ground was bent back. So when this got shoved in there, it wasn't making a connection. It was actually alongside here. So this temperature gauge does work because I hooked it back up and I ran a ground from there right to the back, from the battery right to the back of the negative on here and the gauge worked. And then I took a peek in there and I'm like, oh, that little terminal is not making connection. I reached in there and bent it back, plugged it in and it worked. But another thing, when you take these gauges out, there's a little gasket that goes underneath there. 
you know, when you drop this thing in, there's a little gasket that goes under here. And that gasket was all rotted and deteriorated, and I'm like, that almost looks like a bowl gasket for like a lawnmower. So I went upstairs and got a Wabro bowl gasket, and there's the part number. That thin bowl gasket for that Wabro, and look, it's perfect. Right over that baby. So now when I drop that in, I got that little gasket on there again. And when I tighten it down, it's gonna make a seal. A seal. So I was thinking about these cup holders. You know, remember I said I was gonna take the HV350 and glue them down so it made it nice and tight against there, and I thought, well, if I do that, it makes it kind of permanent. What if I need to pop this thing out so I can get in there at something like this choke cable? So what I did is I drilled a hole, which we're gonna show you, in the cup holder and put one of these little quick fins in there to kind of help hold it in there in case you're out four wheeling and going crazy. You don't want this to come jumping out. So right there, if the cameraman can zoom in there, that's where I put the quick fin right in this little flap here there we go that was on the bottom of that cup holder I drilled a little hole in there shoved that quick pin in there so if I want to take this thing out I pull that quick pin and I can pop that cup holder out it fits in there pretty snug it kind of snaps in there but just to help hold it in there what else are we doing on this thing that we haven't talked about? Oh, I put a new heater hose back here. So I know you can go to Kazuma Parts USA and they sell a lot of parts for this thing, but they're kind of pricey. So you just go to an auto parts store and you can get a half inch piece of heater hose. So that's half inch heater hose that I replaced, but of course all the antifreeze came out when I did that, and it kind of makes a mess. So if you notice, there's a little ball valve here. So I had a 3-8, this is 3-8 pipe thread. I had this hose barb that fit in there. Then I put a piece of hose on there and I ran it off into a bucket so it wouldn't make a mess back here and I opened that valve. And then I put a floor jack under the front of the Kazuma and I jacked this thing up as high as I could go. And then I took the cap off that reservoir, that plastic reservoir, and then the antifreeze started flowing out. And then once it stopped flowing out and I emptied that tank, then I took the radiator cap off. And then more of it flowed out. So you have to worry about this thing getting air locked when you do all that stuff, when you go to refill it. So I left it jacked up, I got it all drained out. I took the hose off and of course antifreeze wanted to come out of here. And we got this nifty little funnel that we're probably gonna start selling in our online store that you can fold and mold. It's coming real handy. We're gonna do a separate video on this thing because I've used this thing for a lot, a lot of different things. Look at, you can mold this funnel to do anything you want. This thing is pretty nice. And y'all like tools. So I done shoved that underneath there and diverted it so it would run all the antifreeze away. So it wouldn't make a mess. Put the new heater hose on. Then I filled it with antifreeze, left this valve open while it was up in the air, started filling it with antifreeze. Then when I heard it coming out of here, threw the hose into the bucket I had, then I came back here and shut the valve off, lowered it on the ground, and then finished filling it up the rest of the way with antifreeze. Then I ran it, and then I got it hot, and then I kind of opened the valve and let it shoot some of that antifreeze out just to make sure there was no air in there. 
and that seemed to work pretty good when I did it that way. As you see, and see, it shots them out. It's under pressure a little bit. So now I can put the bed back on. I'm all done back here finally. Now I can put the bed, drop the bed back on. So we're getting closer and closer to getting this thing done and presentable. I still got to seal the fuel tank. I'm waiting for some red coat. I ordered a can of red coat. I'm going to seal that gas tank. That gas tank had a bunch of rust in it. I had to change the fuel filter like three times because it kept sucking up crap. So we're getting close. We're getting close. Now I got the hood ready for paint. I got it all primed. Look at that patch I put in there. I mean, it looks a lot better than it did. It's not perfect, but again, this isn't a showpiece. But look at it, it turned out pretty nice. It's pretty smooth. That's not a bad patch job. Terra fan that was here, Ferdinand, he used to do auto body work and he gave me a he gave me an A plus on this. He used to paint cars and stuff and I go, this is plastic. This thing's all plastic and it bends. And I showed him what I did for a repair and he went, hey Ferdinand. So now we're gonna paint this with that engine enamel blue. Now this is that paint I was telling you I got from my brother Farrell. You know how old this stuff is? You know how you want to tell how old things are? Look on the can. What do you what do you notice that's missing on a can like this? What's missing, huh? I'm giving you a quiz. That's right. You guessed it. That one brass rat, I heard you. There's no barcode. There's no barcode on here. Everything's got a barcode nowadays. And look, this is the old caps where you had to put a screwdriver in there to pop it off. That's how you know this is old paint. And it's still good. Still sprays good. He gave me like a case of this stuff. Maybe even more. I got a whole box of this stuff upstairs. It's a pretty blue. So we're going to paint the hood, put the headlights and stuff back in. And then one other thing we're going to go over is those hood hinges. A couple other things. And then the next time you see this, it'll be all back together. And we'll be driving it. We'll do something. We'll take it out somewhere. Maybe we'll take it down to Podunk Lake. Who knows? Who knows? So I hear some of you grass rats out there asking, Terrell, Terrell, how did you cut those holes? What, did, what tool did you use to cut those holes in that plastic to put that cup holder in there? I got one of these things that's got a small cup holder. And I want to know what tool you use. So I use my angle grinder with that carbide burr in there. You know, you don't have to grind just steel with these carbide burrs. You can grind all kinds of stuff. So I got this big fat carbide burr and I just went in there and ground it out. You know, I put that template. Remember I showed you the template I made and marked it off? Just went in there and ground it and ground it, kept fitting it until it fit in there. That's what I use. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for sharing that with me.